Tonight, transit riders are on high alert after a teen is stabbed to death at a subway station in Toronto. He was like killed. He was like stabbed in here and he bled out. What can be done to improve safety? Protests boiling over in Israel tonight. After defense ministers fired for speaking out against controversial reforms. A groundbreaking Canadian broadcaster opens up about online abuse. I looked my harasser in his eyes and I told him I'm not scared of you anymore. Jody Vance tells us how she fought back. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. Another deadly Toronto transit attack has left many people wondering just how safe is the system. The latest victim, 16 years old. The teen was stabbed Saturday night at a subway station in Toronto's West End. The attack police say was unprovoked, taking place just one subway stop away from the site of another deadly stabbing three months ago. The teen died shortly after being rushed to hospital. Just the latest incident of apparently random violence that has shaken the city. There are demands for a safer transit system, and not just in Toronto. Here's Lisa Shing. This was from his birthday. A growing memorial for a young life lost. He's so funny. He's such a funny, sweet guy. I like... Out of everyone in the friend group, like he, he was, was like a really like he just was the, kindest. He was the so latest sweet. victim of the violence we like in Canada's largest transit system. Yeah. He didn't die from like being sick or anything. He was like killed, you know. He was like stabbed in here and he bled out. Toronto police say 16-year-old Gabrielle Magaloes was sitting on a bench at this Toronto subway station Saturday evening when a man approached him unprovoked. Shortly after, Magaloes was stabbed. He was rushed to hospital but died not long after. They are not believed to have known each other. This is absolutely a cause for concern and we're going to be evaluating each incident as it, as it comes. Toronto Transit has seen growing violence over the past year and not just stabbings. People have been pushed onto subway tracks, beaten, swarmed and assaulted. And in a shocking incident last summer, a woman died after being set on fire. This is at um, levels that we have never seen before. An uptick in violence has also been reported on transit systems in Vancouver, Saskatoon and Halifax. There is a sense of fear. Uh, there's a sense of unwillingness to continue working in the industry and the profession that we do every day, uh, and rightfully so. In 2022, Edmonton police say violent crime on transit grew by more than 50 percent. In Toronto, it was up by almost the same rate. This is absolutely tragic. Toronto police had added more officers to patrol the transit system, but that program ended two weeks ago. Transit advocates say adding more comps isn't necessarily the answer. We need to be tackling things like the housing and mental health crisis. We need to be paying people more for their work. And Lisa's Akil station tonight. What are we hearing from TTC and Toronto police? Well, Ian, uh, the TTC says that safety is the top priority for both its staff as well as its customers. As for Toronto Police, it says it's monitoring each of these incidents and will disperse their resources uh, when needed. But no doubt that this latest incident will increase pressure on both of them to address the violence on the transit system. Ian? All right, Lisa, thank you. Well, for some insight into safety on public transit, let's bring in Cash Hiita, former West Vancouver police chief, former BC public safety minister, a city councillor now in Richmond, just outside Vancouver. And uh, Cash, what sort of things should we be doing to make public transit in this country feel safer? Well, the number one responsibility we have to make this safer is law enforcement. We need more law enforcement to utilize some of the various tactics on the systems to create a safe environment for people to travel to and from within our transit systems. So that is the number one aspect of it that we need to get more of on our systems. This is what's been utilized throughout North America on some of the major systems that are suffering from some of the same decay that we're mentioning here and some of the crimes that we're mentioning here. Various tactics have worked previously and what it starts out with is 
is a very assertive law enforcement to make people feel safe. You can follow up on that with some security, some guardians put in place in our transit stations and within our systems to make it a little safer environment for people. And we've got to be cognizant of our surroundings for people that are around us, people that we don't feel comfortable uh, in and around. We've got to remove ourselves from those situations or ensure that we have a direct line of communication to authorities that can come in and intervene if there's the possibility of this person acting out. You got to remember a lot of people that utilize our systems are people that have some mental health issues that are causing problems. The frequency of them actually having outbursts on our systems, whether they're on our system to ride to a different location or a system to stay warm or just hanging around our stations is certainly something that we have to be very cognizant of and we have to have responses to their behavior that are very assertive. All right, Kashid, thank you very much. An urgent search is underway tonight in the southern United States for survivors of a devastating tornado. At least 26 people are dead in Mississippi and Alabama. Susanna De Silva shows us the heartbreaking destruction and the stories of survival. Despite the devastation. Yes, yes, I actually was born on this street here, a few houses down, and I grew up over here. LeBriant Knight knows exactly where everything was. Well, houses. Uh, this was a store. This was the neighborhood laundromat. This is where people paid their bills. Knight took shelter in his mom's room in their town of Rolling Fork with her, his nieces, and nephew as the storm hit around 8 p.m. Debris flying, hitting us in the face. I just covered them, grabbed them, and was hoping we didn't fly away. But as soon as I say that, 10 seconds later, everything was over. Over for Rolling Fork, but that was just the beginning of the storm's devastation, tearing across the state, hitting one community after another for an hour, then forming another devastating tornado more than 250 kilometers away from where it started. This was inside the Amory High School as the storm blasted above. Experts say a tornado lasting that long is exceedingly rare. It was some of the most frightening radar images I've seen. Uh, each storm is unique, but you know, on average, yeah, 10 minutes is the, uh, is the time it's on the ground. So this is unusual. The storm hit some of the state's poorest areas. If you're in the path, it's a danger. And if you don't have good housing, it's a real danger. The death toll so far, more than two dozen, including Robert Lee. Kind person, very bubbly spirit, outgoing, wonderful teacher. Along with grieving, thoughts of what comes next. We won't forget it, but we'll, we'll get back to a, a normal state, hopefully. A long process for many, as the year's tornado season is just beginning. Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Four people are dead and three remain unaccounted for after a Pennsylvania chocolate factory exploded. This was the massive blast Friday caught by a local Fox News weather camera. It was reportedly felt up to six blocks away. The factory completely leveled. An investigation into the cause of the explosion is ongoing. That unofficial border crossing at Roxham Road in Quebec is now technically closed after a new agreement was reached between Canada and the U.S. But as Quabina Oduro found out firsthand today, people are still showing up there, hoping to get across. Getting out of these vans, taking their luggage with them, these asylum seekers were hoping to start their new lives in Canada, but that's harder now than just a day ago. <laughs> still, they crossed. In the group, this Venezuelan couple, they said they spent days and more than $1,000 traveling here. And are you thinking about crossing? Yeah? You think it's worth it? Um, there's more into it, like when it comes to our life, there's more stuff like uh, that will make us take that one chance, that one percent chance. As of Saturday, a change to the safe third country agreement between Canada and the United States allows Canada to turn back migrants looking to make asylum claims at unofficial points of entry. 
The RCMP says since 12.01 a.m. March 25th until noon March 26th, six requests have been processed. Two asylum seekers were returned to the U.S., but four were eligible to pursue claims in Canada. That's because there are some exceptions, including for people with Canadian family members or for unaccompanied minors under the new rules. 15,000 migrants will be accepted at official crossings, but those helping asylum seekers settle in Canada say that's a band-aid solution. I think they're just shocked that uh, the Canadian government would do this. And also the whole process by why, how it was done, we, none of the organizations that are on the front line were consulted. This local resident who waits at Roxham Road with mittens for those crossing fears what some in desperate situations will do. By closing Roxham Road, they have opened up almost 9,000 kilometers where people, unfortunately, because they're desperate, are going to start trying to cross and come into Canada and their lives are going to be more in danger. It's a risk that some people are willing to take in search of a better life. And Quibina joins us from Roxham Road. You've been able to keep track of one of the people who crossed this weekend. What's happened to him? Ian, Radio Canada and I have been in contact with one man who was almost accepted entry to one of those exemptions, but he says in the end he was not. He's being transported back to one of the official crossings. He will then be processed and sent back to the U.S. He says what happens to him after that, he does not know, but he's hoping to make a life in the U.S. As for Roxham Road, migrants are still coming here because the news that they are not allowed to hasn't traveled far enough yet. All right, Quibina, thank you. There's growing unrest in Israel tonight after the prime minister fired his defense minister for challenging a plan to overhaul the justice system. As David Common shows us, protesters took to the streets by the thousands. Israel is at a crossroads, demonstrations getting increasingly violent in a dispute not with others but between Israelis. When protesters breached barricades around Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's home, they were met with water cannons. They fear what he is on the verge of achieving. I'm fighting for the future of my country as I know it. I grew up in the Soviet Union. I know exactly what it means to, to live in a dictatorship regime. Sunday into Monday's mass protests with at least tens of thousands in the streets kicked off with this. <laughs> The defense minister warning that anger and fear were taking over the country and calling for the prime minister to pause controversial plans to reform the judicial system. Soon after, Yoav Gallant was fired. Netanyahu is intent on pushing through changes to give the government, his government, far more power. Netanyahu calls this a proper rebalancing between authorities. Protesters, though, see it as a direct threat to what is widely seen as the Middle East's only democracy, a controversial prime minister with frequent troubles with the law empowering himself. What we are doing here tonight is protesting against the government, wants to get all the power to itself. Still, Netanyahu appears to have the votes to get it done, but mass protests like this throw everything into question. It's not clear what happens next. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. According to Japan and South Korea, North Korea has launched two ballistic missiles into the sea, the latest of several this year alone, just as a Royal Canadian Naval Frigate heads for the region. HMCS Montreal, the first of three frigates deployed over the next 12 months to monitor the UN sanctions imposed on Pyongyang. It's part of Canada's long-term strategy to boost its presence in the region. Tonight, NATO, the European Union and Ukraine are condemning the latest nuclear statements from Vladimir Putin. He announced Russia is putting tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Thomas Dagla explains Putin's latest saber-rattling and what's behind it. Russia rarely lets on that it's suffering casualties in Ukraine, but the funeral of a 23-year-old soldier underlines the losses are real. Now the ringleader of the invasion is signaling an even darker turn ahead. On Russian state TV, President Vladimir Putin said he's struck a deal with his ally from Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. A plan to house 
tactical nuclear weapons under Russian control in Belarus. I do not think that, um, it, you know, it's a panic time or anything like that. It's Putin trying to escalate because he has problems. Putin's plan would see storage facilities built by this summer in Belarus, Ukraine's northern neighbor. A senior Ukrainian official tweeted the Kremlin took Belarus as a nuclear hostage, while the EU called it a threat to European security, warning Belarus of further sanctions. Tactical nuclear weapons are much smaller than the kind mounted on intercontinental ballistic missiles designed for attacks on the battlefield, but they've never been used and carry huge risks. A White House spokesman downplayed the intimidation in an interview on CBC News' Rosemary Barton Live. You've seen nothing that would indicate uh, Mr. Putin is uh, preparing to, to use tactical nuclear weapons in any way whatsoever. It was just last week that Putin welcomed China's leader, Xi Jinping, to Moscow. She didn't publicly promise Russia any weapons, but appears to have left the Kremlin emboldened. This is not a coincidence that we're seeing now um, what Putin is doing. Putin pointed out Washington stores part of its own nuclear arsenal abroad, but NATO quickly highlighted a big difference. The alliance says Western nations respect nuclear arms control agreements, and Putin does not. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Washington. And as you just saw, top White House security official John Kirby spoke to CBC's Rosemary Barton today. In that Canadian exclusive, Kirby also said the U.S. supports the government in its handling of China's election interference. As Marina von Stackelberg explains, with all the scrutiny in Ottawa on this issue, there are stakes for Washington, too. As Ottawa swirls with accusations over the government's handling of China's interference in Canadian elections, the U.S. has sent a signal of support in a Canada-exclusive interview on Rosemary Barton Live. We share Prime Minister Trudeau's deep concerns over this. He has launched an investigation. We understand the Parliament is also looking into this. We think that's the right thing to do. Uh, in the United States, he'll have a, a friend and a partner should he need any. And the issue brought into the spotlight after stories from the Globe and Mail and Global News. They detail Beijing's efforts to interfere in our last two federal elections, all based on leaked information from anonymous intelligence officials. Canada is a member of the Five Eyes, a partnership with the U.S. and other allies to share spy information. John Kirby says despite the national security leaks, that relationship remains undamaged. There's no breach of trust with, with Canada or, or the Five Eyes relationship whatsoever. The report alleges China was trying to help the Liberals. Opposition parties want to know what the Trudeau government knew and when they knew it. But the U.S. has been careful not to wade into that. We will continue to do everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. Nothing to add. <laughs> As the largest providers of intelligence in the Five Eyes Alliance, the Americans would be concerned with leaks in Canada, says this former diplomat. When there is a breach of security, as there has been over the last month, on the Canadian part, obviously our allies are concerned because the intelligence they provide to us, they want to be sure, will be respected. Trudeau has appointed a special rapporteur to look into foreign election interference, with two months to decide whether a national public inquiry is warranted. But calls here from the opposition continue to mount for an inquiry to be called immediately. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. The Prime Minister has also been under pressure to provide more help to Haiti, a country that is increasingly under gang control. This thing has gone too far now. But is Ottawa's help too little too late? Hey, my man, can I help you? Let me get an autograph. A Hollywood actor is facing charges after allegations of assault. And the goat that showed up unexpectedly. It just strolled out like it owned the place. And refuse to leave. Nope. We're back in two. Actor Jonathan Majors was arrested last night in New York on assault, strangulation, and harassment charges. The alleged victim is a 30-year-old woman who police say had minor injuries to her head and neck. She was taken to hospital in stable condition. Majors was released from custody a few hours after the incident and is claiming through his lawyer that he is innocent.
The Canadian government has promised $100 million in an effort to restore peace and security to Haiti. Violent gangs are now believed to be in control of much of the country. As Evan Dyer tells us, even with the Canadian funding, there are immense challenges to overcome and deep uncertainty over Haiti's future. Even in Petionville, the last relatively safe haven in Port-au-Prince, people are abandoning their homes and fleeing. The lucky ones will end up in makeshift camps like Delma 19. The gangs invaded us, says Natasha Germain. I lost my husband and now I'm alone with five children. The camp is full, but the gangs continue to burn and drive people from their homes. President of the United States of America. In Ottawa, there were more signs the U.S. has given up trying to push Canada to intervene militarily. That is not off the table, but that is not in play at the moment. Instead, both leaders talked about helping Haiti's national police, with Trudeau announcing $100 million for the force. With the Haitian government barely functioning, it's going to be difficult to make sure the funding is spent as intended. And the money comes late in the game. Trudeau has been talking about helping and training Haiti's police for months, but little has been done. And the force has started to crumble under the pressure of killings. If it had come earlier and had been done right, yes, there's lives that would have been saved. While Haiti's police waited for new training, the head of training was murdered inside his own academy. This month, the inspector general of police was kidnapped along with his daughter as he dropped her at school. Earlier would have been better, but uh, it is what it is. So let's work from there. This expert says it's now too late for Haiti's police to go it alone. This thing has gone too far now. The national police is on the defensive. They are losing uh, territory on a regular basis to the gangs, and they don't have the capacity, the manpower, and the, the strategic uh, capacity to, to reverse this situation. Before even rebuilding Haiti's police, everyone agrees it needs to be cleaned up, getting rid of perhaps half of its officers who are corrupt or tied to gangs. The good cops who remain will be even thinner on the ground and even more outgunned by gangs who clearly have the upper hand. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. All eyes will be on Christian Freeland this Tuesday when the federal budget is set to be unveiled. It's expected that it will lay out some measures to ease the effect of rising costs across the country. As Kate Kyle shows us, right now food banks are filling the gap for many households. Ooh, look at all the juice, ladies. Delivery day. Donated food rolls into the Yellowknife Women's Centre. If they have enough, they provide food hampers for the community. Yes, we're probably going to do about five boxes today. The smell of citrus brings smiles, especially since food donations are down. Like for the month of December, I don't even think we even did a hamper because there wasn't very much food that was coming from food rescue. So yeah, it was pretty tough for the past few months. Yeah, so these shelves is where we uh, store the food before it gets packed to go into a hamper. Operators at food banks are also reporting fewer donations, despite the need growing 36% last year in the three territories. So what we're seeing right now across Canada is the highest level of food bank use ever in Canadian history. There are many reasons donations are not keeping pace with that need. Simply, we're out of practice as a country because of the pandemic. We didn't, you know, we weren't doing those regular food drives. Or if it's simply because purchasing food right now is a stretch for folks. Again, I think it goes to food prices um, as well. Inflation uh, just uh, overall has been tough for people. And uh, yeah, we're, we are definitely concerned about uh, what the future looks like. Okay, they're all the same. Martha Carew's part-time job doesn't bring in enough money to buy all the food she needs. This hamper gives her room to breathe. I feel so good. At, at least I know I'm going to have something to eat tonight and tomorrow and the next day. Still, she consciously only picks up one box each month, not more, saving them for larger families. The people were tipped. Yeah. Until things improve, food banks and the people who need them will keep doing more with less. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Yellowknife. A high-profile broadcaster is speaking out about the harassment she endured for years. 
I'm Jody Vance, live from the New Look Rogers Centre. Jody Vance tells me about the online hate that made her worry about her and her son's safety. I would warn my young son if he saw this person to run to safety. That's trauma. And the calls for more family doctors goes unanswered. I've been promised universal health care and I feel I've been lied to. The frustration felt by patients and doctors. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Center for From the breaking Jets. ground as the first Canadian woman to host a primetime sports show, Jody Vance, we to breakfast television in Vancouver. When are we going to get the full platform on what the Liberals are bringing to this election? Jody Vance has been a fixture on Canadian television for decades. Hi, everybody. But like many public figures, that profile has come with a price. Relentless online abuse. This individual targeted me in ways that were remarkable. And one harasser went extreme sending hundreds of hateful emails so threatening, Vance worried about the safety of her young son. She decided to take action, figured out who he was, went to the police, and he was eventually charged with criminal harassment. I am not finished with this. I didn't get the justice that I feel is deserved in this case. The case ended with a guilty plea, but the sentence, probation, leaves questions about whether it's enough of a deterrent for others whose online conduct becomes criminal. You do this, and you will immediately have consequences for your actions. I sat down with Jody Vance to hear about her experience. Jody, thank you very much for doing this. Glad to be here. In terms of the, the intensity, the frequency, tell us about these emails that you were getting. It started like a typical communication might happen between a listener and a host. And then it really quickly escalated into nastiness, misogyny, sexualization and, and threats and I was like stop please stop I responded to him three times asking him to stop and he wouldn't so then I blocked and blocked and blocked and it got even more angry and more demanding and and this individual was see I don't even say his name for so long I didn't say his name but this individual would comb through my social media, screen cap it, Photoshop it, then take it, email it to me, and email it to my colleagues, mm -hmm. my coworkers, my guests on my shows, um, with sexualized, violent, threatening words uh, that made me feel unsafe. And this turned into criminal harassment, and the judge looked at this and said, you know, there's no place in civil society for this, because though they are words and they are online, they had a deep impact on your day-to-day -day life. Tell us about that. I felt unsafe. I felt unsafe personally. I felt my son was unsafe and at risk everywhere he went. It, it, <laughs> honestly, it, this is the biggest piece for me that it impacted my family the way it did. I can never get back that tender time in my son's life, those seven years of feeling fearful for his safety. I'm, I put myself at risk, right? Being As in the public, public person, eye. Yeah. Yes. Um, he didn't sign up for that. We locked our doors when we were at home. We closed the blinds in our house. We didn't go out as much as we might have. I would switch out the license plate on my car regularly. I would drive to and from places differently. Mm. I would warn my young son if he saw this person to run to safety, find an adult. Yeah. And that, that's trauma. Yeah. That's not words on a page. That's true. I mean, we live in a safe city. You should be able to walk around. Your kids should be safe. It is true for most people. You did not feel that way for a long yeah. period of time. And, and that is, you know, deeply unfortunate. Um, some of this fueled, and I think a lot of people watching can relate to this, by the intensity that people felt, including your harasser, um, about the pandemic. No doubt. Um, people have chosen sides or decided what the science is, done their own research, have an opinion on how things have been politically managed. As a broadcaster, I dictated none of that. I communicated it. If you disagree with my opinions or my position or even what I'm broadcasting in a segment, that's fine. But you're not allowed to attack me. 
well, attack you in a criminal way that is demeaning and, and threatening, right? right? And so um, so there are a lot of people, a lot of doctors, broadcasters, many others, uh, men and women who have been subjected to this, but, but, but there was something different because you were a woman here in the way that this was sexualized and, and, and you're not alone. No, I'm an entitled white woman. I feel for the black indigenous women of color in this country that I'm in communication with some of them now who are having inboxes filled with hate I cannot even imagine. And what happened to me was enough. I'm standing up to say none of this is normal and should be met with swift and meaningful consequences. It, it, it is astounding to me how much misogyny and hate and, and threatening communication is happening right now, normalized in that way. Not lost on me that this all started around the same time that Donald Trump came down an escalator um, and it started to be almost celebrated by a slice of society to attack women with opinions or platforms or a powerful message of any kind. And The difference in your case is that this ended up in court, you know, in part through your determination to, to see that happen. So he had his day in court, but more importantly, you had your day in court. What was that like? It was satisfying. It, I had had that date circled on my calendar for a long time. I would suggest too long <laughs> that I waited to go to court. But I was ready when I went in there. I had never seen Richard Oliver in person, and I felt it was my day. I looked my harasser in his eyes, and I told him, I'm not scared of you anymore and you will have consequences. And so he got a suspended sentence, no jail time, no fine, no uh, community service. Um, and I know you're disappointed by that. So was this whole process worth it? Yes, I'm his prior. If he ever does this to anybody ever again, he will go to jail. And that's the message I have to anybody being harassed, male, female, if you're being harassed, Follow it through so the person who would do it to you can never do it to someone else without more severe and perhaps more swift, meaningful consequences. Vance doesn't feel that she had the input she should have in the criminal case, but she's going to get another shot of this. She is suing the harasser in civil court, a, a situation where she can control the strategy in court that time around. Next time, a familiar situation is unfolding across Canada, impacting millions of Canadians. I was uh, abandoned by my family doctor, and I'm looking uh, for a replacement. The struggle to find a family doctor and the pressure on an already stretched system. Next. Provinces are signing new health care funding deals with the federal government, and one of Ottawa's main priorities through that process is improving family medicine. Millions of Canadians simply don't have access to a family physician. Nick Purden takes a look at the toll that's taking on patients and doctors. I was uh, abandoned by my family doctor, and I'm looking uh, for a replacement. I'm 81 years old. I have medical conditions. I am, for the first time in my life, without a family doctor. I've been promised universal health care, and I feel I've been lied to. Hi, Kathy. Hello, Hi. how are you? It pains me that the folks who are in our community without access to a family doctor, and I feel terrible that I can't take on more people because we can barely take care of the people we already have. As Canadians, we're told we have universal health care. We're proud of it. It's become part of our identity. But is it true? Because millions of Canadians today don't have a family doctor. Is the promise of universal health care in Canada broken? I've been phoning family physicians uh, almost everywhere within a two hour drive of here and uh, there's nobody taking any, uh, any new patients. Meet Hugh Greenwood. His family doctor moved away a year ago, and ever since he's been searching for a new one. I phone. The answer is they will look for me, but don't hold your breath that uh, there are few doctors taking new patients and um, 
chances are slim, if at all. Yu takes medication for his hypertension and thyroid condition, but he only has a few months' supply left. When I open the pill container, I'm thinking what's going to happen if I don't get my renewals. I know that my blood won't be thin enough to, to stop clotting, and I probably won't be here that long. Hugh understands he could go to a walk-in clinic and see someone about his medications, but at his age and with his complex medical problems, he wants his own family doctor. In this area, all around Owen Sound, Ontario, there are many people without a family physician. Things have gotten so bad that take a look at this. Along the highway, at both ends of town, there are these billboards advertising for physicians. The shortage of family doctors is a national problem. More than six million Canadians don't have one. And it's not just patients looking for doctors, it's entire towns. I'm up here. I'm in Marmara, Ontario. And Dr. Emily Callery shows me what they have to offer to get a doctor to come here. Wow. Yeah. Pretty nice. Mm hmm Really nice view this way. This is one of the two clinical spaces that's offered um, rent-free accommodation for any physicians that we recruit to the area. We've got a nice loft space upstairs, so there's actually a, a bedroom and a, and a bathroom can we go upstairs. Look? Of course we can. Yeah. After you. Dr. Callery is a family physician here, but they need another one because there are a thousand people in the surrounding right. area who go without. And get this, Dr. Callery has been searching for two years. So a physician could live here rent-free for how long? For, for five years, the term of their duration here. Um, it's a great opportunity. I think a lot of physicians could also just see it as a place to, to land, to get their feet settled, which is a huge incentive. It was the incentives that brought Dr. Callery here. But she never thought her duties would include recruiting other physicians. You're already trying to do your day-to-day -day clinical work and your administrative work. I think it does add to that stress to feel like you have to also be wearing a recruiter's hat. And, and that is a mental stress that you just don't want to carry because you do feel that responsibility and an onus to take on more patients in the community, take on more patients into your practice. And when you can't, it's pretty heartbreaking to try to turn away people who you know desperately need that, that family care, that primary practitioner. The need for a new doctor here is critical, so much so that the town's offer also includes money, a lot of money. $100,000 is a signing bonus. That's also matched $100,000 from Hastings County. In addition to the provincially offered incentive, there's another $80,000 to be, to be had from that, definitely. $280,000 and they still can't find someone. How come? To answer that, I'm on my way to meet the person who has done the most comprehensive study of primary care in Ontario. Dr. Michael Green is a family physician, and he heads up the family medicine program at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He tells me there's no single reason for the shortage. Our training programs have not kept pace with training enough people to do family medicine. There were more doctors retired during the pandemic than usual, uh, about double compared to average. Um, and there's a lot of doctors coming up on retirement. Put that together with a population that keeps growing, and the family doctor shortage is a kind of time bomb. Millions of Canadians without family doctors, what's, what's the solution? I think one of the answers is teams. For me, it's really important that I have a relationship with my patient, but a system that relies only on doctors is not going to be able to get us out of this crisis. Doctors like me need to be able to have support from a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, a community paramedic, a social work counselor, a whole team to help provide the kind of care that the more complex patients I'm seeing today need. Dr. Green wants this kind of team approach across the board. But for that to happen, governments need to spend more money on primary care. And Canada only spends about half as much as other industrialized nations. You know, is, is the promise of universal health care, is, is that a broken promise? I think it is. If you don't have access to a family doctor in Canada, you can't access fully all of the benefits of our publicly funded health care system because you don't have an entry point and you don't have someone to coordinate your care. Yeah, come on down. The problem is more than just the huge number of Canadians who don't have a family doctor. It's also the conditions family physicians work in because of the shortage. Alrighty. Here in Verona, Ontario, Dr. Saber Givens is the only family doctor in town. Okay. So what are your
your concerns today? So I saw the rheumatologist. Dr. Week. Gibbons okay. has 2,500 patients. That's around double the usual number. For seven years, I've been looking for someone to partner with so that we could share the load. And we're still looking. I had no clue that seven years later, I would still be looking for a practice partner. So can you go to your daily patterns? And Dr. Gibbons tells me that's taken a toll. It's a struggle. Um, it's, it's a lot. Um, I'm not able to practice up to the standards that I was hoping to. And I'm so busy every day fighting fires and seeing the people who are coming in and all the questions and whatnot that things slip. Things slip just because you don't have enough time. Yes, all the time. And there are people that call in and they, they want to be seen today. They have an oppressing concern today and I don't even know about it until I see them a month later because I can't possibly hear about every single person that's calling in and I can't, I can't see them when they want to be seen. We really feel like we're failing. I feel like I'm failing on a regular basis that I can't meet those needs. Knowing what you know now, looking back, would, would you have taken the job? If I had known then what I know now, I probably would have chosen differently. So your liver function tests are totally fine. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Totally Gibbons says normal. she'll keep working because and she cares about her patients. Yep. But she's an example fine. of how hard it is to work in a system that's maxed out. All right. Good. And how it doesn't work for doctors we'll or patients. Or can okay. I'm on heart medication and uh, thyroid, and, and uh, I don't have a physician to um, renew prescriptions for me. For Hugh Greenwood, he's worried that not having a family doctor will shorten his life. Um, I have grandchildren that I, that I care about. I have a wife that uh, I care about, and, and I would like to be here for a while. What does your situation tell you about the promise of universal health care? It bothers me that um, we keep on hearing that we have universal health care, and I think, I don't think so. All of a sudden, there are cracks in our, in our system, and uh, it's, it's not universal health care anymore. Nick Purden, CBC News, Owen Sound, Ontario. And as Nick laid out, there are many reasons why there aren't enough family doctors right now. One of them is training. Fewer medical graduates are choosing to specialize in family medicine. Between 2015 and 2021, that percentage dropped from about 38% to about 32. Next, a BC family returns home from vacation and discovers an uninvited guest. It was terrifying. <laughs> I was like, oh no, so we shut and locked the window. The goat that made itself at home in our moment. Trying to win a second straight bronze medal. Make the final eight to five. Canada is your winner. And it's Canada beating Sweden for bronze at the Women's World Curling Championship for the second year in a row. A pretty good finish for Skip Kerry Anderson and team today. Canada was knocked out of gold medal contention by Norway. Well, here's something different. Imagine coming home from your spring break vacation, opening the door and seeing a goat had comfortably settled in. That is what happened to a BC family last week. A goat took over their shed while they were away and refused to leave when they returned. Gordo the goat is our moment. It owns the place pretty much. I came home, I was unloading the car, I opened up the door and a big old billy goat came out. And what was your reaction? Um, well, I ran. I wasn't expecting to have a goat move in while I was gone. It just strolled out like it owned the place. It wasn't scared of anything. Oh, hey buddy. I don't know how long it's been here. We were gone for seven days before we got back, but it's been here for at least two. We named it Gordo. We've been feeding it, letting it out, because it keeps locking itself back in the shed. It tries to get into the house every time we come outside. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Add to the 
Sort of. It's tried to break into our windows. <laughs> what was that like having a goat's head coming in your window? Um, it was terrifying. <laughs> I was like, oh no. So we shut and locked the window. And are you a fan of goats yourself? No, no, I'm terrified of goats. <laughs> Uh, we're trying to find anywhere else for it to go. We're definitely not set up for it here, and we're not farmers. So she's terrified of goats, though she does find Gordo kind of amusing. Her 10-year-old son said, why don't we keep it? Tanya said, no, not going to happen. Uh, one of my colleagues, Julia, wants me to make sure that you know that the goat is at a farm, basically a foster farm, while they try to figure out where Gordo's... Uh, kind of permanent home is. Um, and one other thing, Andrew Criata, uh, our CBC colleague who shot that story, was headbutted all the way back to his vehicle. There's four minutes of unusable footage on his tape. That is The National for March 26th. Thanks for being with us. Have a good night. <laughs>